show on the road. So this panel is DAX. What will it take to reach mass adoption? So we have a lot of great panels today, um, one of whom has undergone a gender change, but we will allow you to explain that in just a bit. So my name is Amy Wan. I'm founder and CEO of SageWise. We do investor support and outsource compliance for security token offerings. Um, but basically, last year, at the end of the year, we launched our own DAP just for fun, called Sandios, and learned a ton, right? Um, and we also have a lot of founders here who have also launched DAP. DAP. So let's hear from their experience. Do you guys want to quickly just go down the road, introduce yourselves, talk quickly about your company, what it does? I'm Adam Wolf, founder of Digibike Pay, and uh, I've also recently joined Block 30 Labs. I'm not sure if you've heard about them, but we just launched some uh, exchange traded index funds. And uh, with Digibyte Pay, I'm just focused on building a point of sale application around the Digibyte ecosystem and all kinds of different products to help retailers accept uh, Digibyte payments. And with Block30 Labs, we're sort of integrating that technology and building it into a bigger ecosystem with a marketplace and uh, a full range of products to accept new new cryptos as well as uh, Digibyte. Cool, I'm Ben Sigman, CTO of Sense. We have a chat application built on the EOS blockchain uh, that uses your EOS keys to encrypt your chat and video messages. And I'm substituting him for Crystal. <laughs> so you might have been expecting Crystal here with her Crystal she, she wasn't able to make it, she just had a baby. Um, my name's Emily Bush. Um, I do a couple different things. Um, I'm one of the founders of Shios, which is the only female founded and funded block producer on EOS. Um, I also have a fund called Decentra that invests in different blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies. Um, and then my most recent venture is something called Time Advisors. Um, so we've automated the fundraising process for um, funds and for companies going through raises. Mainly not in seed though, more like Series A. I'm Shiv Badan, I'm the CEO of Block Party. We're a live event ticketing um, blockchain protocol. We uh, launched last year and have been ticketing music festivals and now moving into esports and sports. Um, you know, really trying to solve the problems of fraud and bots uh, and the things that exist in ticketing right now. Fantastic. So, Emily, you and I were talking backstage and you said you have a list of five challenges that DAFs face. Um, and, and, and the hurdles that they have to come across in terms of getting more adoption. Do you want to quickly go over that list? We'll, we'll talk about each of them in more detail. And if there's anything that you guys want to add to that list, um, please feel, feel free to chime in. But Emily, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the big things, of course, is a native token. Um, having a native token on your platform and someone having to transition, a cryptocurrency user or even a non-cryptocurrency user having to transition to a native token is just a single barrier of entry. Another one is the price volatility. Um, then there's marketing and messaging. Um, and then there's technology, the underlying protocol technology as well as what you're actually building, and then design. Um, and that's kind of how I think I look at it when I'm looking at these different um, dApps that are coming out. I'm like, are you actually hitting all of those? The one that I kind of find really interesting um, is the native token. Um, and I, I think about it from like a user experience standpoint. So for instance, if you are a cryptocurrency user and you are trying to go sign into an application or a, a DAP, um, you typically go and you register and then you're like, oh shoot, I don't hold the native token. So you then take your Ethereum and you move it over and you tra trade it for the native token and then you wait. And then once you get the native token, then you transfer it over to the wallet and then you wait. And then finally, it's in the right wallet and you can register and go and sign on and use the platform. Now, if you're a non-cryptocurrency user, as probably everybody else knows in here, you sign on, you register on whatever application it is, and then you're like, what is a native token? And then you go beyond that to say, what is MetaMask? Or whatever you're using to transfer it. Transfer it and then most likely you get lost somewhere on Instagram and forget the entire process. And then if you actually are a regular platform that isn't decentralized, that doesn't have a native token, it's such a simple model. You just pretty much go on, you use Google, Facebook, or a credit card, and you're in the used platform. So that, for me, is like one very clear and obvious barrier to entry. Yeah, but do you know of any dApps that don't have their own? Don't, don't have their own what? Don't have their own token. That do or don't? I, mean, I think what makes, what separates a dApp from an app in my mind is that it has a token. 
yeah. uh, uses tokens somehow. Yeah. Most DAOs have their own tokens. Yeah, no, saying? that's what I'm saying. That is the barrier to entry. Like having a native token is a barrier to entry because even if you are a cryptocurrency user, you still have to go through the process of trading into, unless you've just got it for the ICO, like you still have to go through the process of trading into whatever that is and then using it on the platform. And even that process, because typically, like even if you're EOS based, but more applications currently are Ethereum based, there's still this waiting period that's still a barrier to entry to actually getting to a place where you can register and use the platform. Now, I think that'll get easier over time. I think when we look at, like for instance, the technology part of those kind of the list of five, like you'll see that right now protocols kind of work for DApps, and they'll start to get even better for DApps, and like the entire process will get easier. But I think. Like, that's been one of the major barriers to entry. You have 4 million or 40 million cryptocurrency users, and most apps are having trouble getting over a thousand users on their applications. That's totally crazy. Like, that's insane. Like, that's wild. Yeah, I'm just curious, like, how many people in here have a DAP or an app, an app on blockchain? Wow. Okay. That's a good Not percentage. Bad. Yeah, okay, you guys came to the right panels. <laughs> but maybe, you know, the audience we want to be speaking to is those who do not currently use a DAP, right? And why aren't you using it? I mean, I mean this poses a, a question. You, you listed off a bunch of challenges. Maybe the, the, you know, topic of this panel is, will DAPs reach mass adoption? <laughs> right? the, the thing that we started with was, we started with, uh, you know, music ticketing. So we, we would go out to music festivals and, and get them to adopt our ticketing platform. And you know, I would go on a Twitter to promote that, hey, we've got this, we've got this uh, ticketing platform on the blockchain. But I wasn't really targeting crypto people. I was targeting music people, people who wanted to, you know, 99% of the people that were going to the concerts were um, you know, non-crypto users. And, I would get this massive backlash, blockchain, what the app is this, who gives a shit, you know, and, and so we realized that we didn't have a product problem, we had a market problem. When you think about product market fit, we weren't targeting the right market for our product. We, there's nothing wrong, the way that we use for our UX, you know, the token is, is very seamless in the back end, but uh, the problem that we had was it wasn't, we weren't targeting the, the crypto audience, so we, we switched our market focus, our business development focus, and actually went out to, to crypto conferences, went to music events where there were, you know, and that, where there was a natural crypto audience, more house music than, say, you know, trap music. And, and so we, we, we had to become very granular about how we did that. And I think if you target the people in this room who are naturally interested in solving the problems that we're looking at, um, you know, we're, we're going to be more successful. And then, branch out from there. Um, what that's, did you find when you switched? What did you find like, that happened from Everyone's that's excited. The mark, that's like what I was talking about in terms of like marketing messaging, right? Everyone's excited. Yeah. I, I found that people are, even when our UX was inferior, I think our UX is a lot better now, but when our UX at the beginning stages was inferior, we still had blockchain and crypto people who were genuinely excited about it. What were they excited about specifically? Yeah. That it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we, were, we were one of the you know early company that built quickly and, and had a product out in four months you know, after we raised money and there were very few people that had a product out and they were just happy that it worked uh, and then we realised okay well let's, let's let's make this look good because I want to you know I, my target is to to crush Ticketmaster and Eventbrite but I mean in order to do that I have to get the real world you know on. Yeah, on it, not just us, not all these cool people in this room. I love how sometimes expectations in this space are just just, just a little bit lower. <laughs> I have a question. You said your token is on the back end, so do your users never actually have to use private keys or anything like that? Uh, so when they, um, so we use encrypted biometrics. So basically that enables the chain of custody of the ticket. It also enables the user to sort of, um, on, you know, just to use their rewards that they earn, we call them rewards that they earn for uh, getting discounts. So if you promote the, you know, if you promote a particular event or if you bring a friend to an event, then you'll earn a reward. The reward will be, can be applied as a discount to your ticket sale. So kind of like Expedia, you know, like a typical membership reward. 
or, or a transaction-based reward. So the the usage of the token is never really prevalent in the front end for new users. For people who are onboarding the token from, say, the token sale, yeah, that's when you have to have the the typical process. But we find that um, a lot of the new users are just downloading the app, they don't have the, the token, and they're essentially just um, earning it and using it and spending it. And that's, that's the main use. Have you guys dealt with onboarding and offboarding a of fiat? Like into fiat? Offboarding is a bit tough. Yeah, yeah. We're still navigating the, the regulatory environment for that. I mean, yeah. uh, but onboarding is fine. I have a quick question, and, and this really kind of comes to the heart of you know, the design architecture piece is if we're talking about mass adoption, then theoretically my grandma needs to be able to not only use MetaMask, but like have a wallet and know how to register and know how to use private keys and, and be relatively sure about the security of custodying her tokens. Grandma's never going to use We're talking about mass adoption, right? Yeah. Isn't that the target? Well, I don't know. I think we should maybe define mass adoption a little bit. Okay, so let's define mass adoption. Does mass adoption mean Amy's grandma? I don't know, you know? I mean, I think it's really interesting is like... Yeah, you does your grandma use Airbnb? Okay, my mom. My mom or my dad. Okay. okay, so we redefined the target audience. But my mom, like, I, I just don't see her using private keys. I mean, it's all got to be hidden at some point, right? It has to be seamless, it's got to be easy. So as developers, I think we need to focus on the pain points and figure out how to abstract away from them and hide them and make it on par with the current system. That way it's, it's not so in your face that it's crypto. And I think it just needs to live in the background somewhere eventually. And uh, it does have a security impact, though. You know, the, the security impact of just having a, you know, an encrypted biometric login or a QR code is um, is definitely, you know, disintermediating. You know, what we were initially thinking what was going to be the, the security of you know, cryptocurrency. But I think you've got to, if you're a DAO like us, I mean, it's. It's maybe as not as critical because people are just sort of earning it and using it. It's not necessarily they're acquiring massive amounts of token and it's the core part of the business. So. I feel like that you probably thought about a lot about this with sense and like how yeah. how it's going to operate with it. I mean, how it operates with the token and how you're going to get Amy's mom. Do you mean specifically <laughs> yeah. Amy's mom? You know, I know you stay up at night till at least four a.m. Right. Yeah, Amy's that's true. Yeah. So I, I feel like you probably have a lot of thoughts on. Well, I think is like, it's not the question, I, I think the question I was asking in the past year was like, what can we do with this token? What can the token do in the platform? And the better question is really, what do people actually want to use a token for? Right? So because like, for most, we can go with a million things that tokens can do. They have all this possibility of things that they can do, but if no one wants to actually use them for those things, then it's pretty much uh, useless, you know what I mean? So, I, so one of the things that we've thought about at SenseChat is like, you know, something that, something that can be actually tokenized in chat is like the likes and weights of messages, you know? And so using the token to transfer value, like when, when you like someone's message, it actually is you saying like, hey, I really value whatever you put there for whatever reason, maybe it was funny or maybe it, you know, it, it made a really great point, maybe you think about something. And so this is kind of like the way that we are, we're rolling out a feature for that coming up. That's one of the use cases of the token here, which is, you know, it's not totally invisible to the user, because they're going to choose, oh, I liked this message now, how many tokens go along with that like? Adam, do you have any thoughts on, you know, how, how, DAP, how DAPs have worked with what your company's doing? Uh, we've thought about that. One of the, the main pain points is when you're using a, a native token, or a, a token, you have to have the underlying protocol that's built on. So you got to have, your, if it say it's Ethereum, so ERC-20 tokens, you have to have some Ethereum in order to pay the fees to transfer those. And that's, that's a pain point that we're, we're working on now, because we're, we're actively building on top of DigiAssets, which is a second layer protocol. And so we're trying to figure out how do we how do we make that seamless? And it, it's definitely a pain point, so uh, we're all working on it, right? So I, I don't really know what the answer is at this point, but 
eventually I think it will be streamlined and, and integrated. It's just going to take time. There's something that seems strange to me in the, in the crypto space, which is, you know, with everything on the regular internet, everything's about as few clicks as humanly possible. In the crypto space, it's like 20, you know, for every one click you would have with a regular app, it's like 20 clicks or, or steps that you have to take. How do we, how do we fix that? So this is the this is the design piece that I was talking about, right? It's like we have so in this space we have such a focus on core technology, yeah. and such a less focus on user experience and actual design. And even like I keep going back to Airbnb as as an example. I've worked in real estate for a while, so I, I really enjoy Airbnb. But um, like their entire system was built by designers, not built by like engineers when it was originally kind of put together. And so like even coming at it from a different angle, um, which is just not where we're kind of, I think quite, I think we're getting there, but but originally just like coming at it from a different angle is also like a really key portion of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that she's right. Like we need to think, well, ideally what we need to be thinking about is the end user, you know, and what does the end user want and what will they actually use? And to build from there and to keep things really simple I mean, one of the reasons that we switched from Ethereum to EOS at Sense was because EOS has accounts that are human readable. So there's already an advantage there. And you don't need to <laughs> try to get all of these letters and numbers correct in this, you know, 50 character long thing to send someone a token or a message. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the idea of decentralization. <laughs> for DAFs. Do DAFs have to be decentralized? Does that fundamentally not make it a DAF? I, I don't think so. I think as long as a DAF has a token in it, you know, then it's a DAF. Okay. Yeah. But I, I think that decentralization is a good goal. And, it, and when I say decentralization, the way I think about it is in terms of the way that we handle data. You know, where that data is stored, how it's transmitted, and who has control of it at each phase of that. And ultimately, one of the great things about blockchain is the golden rule is own your own keys. So when you were saying earlier, like, we need to get away from keys, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that exactly, but I think that's kind of like the thing, is you control your keys, then no matter where your data goes, it, it almost doesn't even matter. It could be on a server. It could be, um, you know, you on keys? Emily's computer. Do you see like a key is like your credit card number? I think it's like, you're more like your social security number, you know? It's like an identifier. But like I have multiple. Social keys. security numbers? Wow. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but keys, right? I have yeah. multiple, we, we have multiple keys mm -hmm. based on the different wallets that we hold. We have multiple credit cards based on the different banks we use or yeah, processing know. systems we use. I view my credit cards. You do? Yeah. You what? I view them my credit cards. Yeah. Because if, if I lose my credit cards, somebody picks it up and swipes it, yeah. they can spend my money. So, yeah. Um, I think. Yeah, my credit cards. <laughs> and you can always call the credit card agency and say, hey, someone took my card. Yeah, yeah. no recourse here. I think, I think decentralization is interesting. I think that when I think about, like, I'm going to take it back to one of the principles that I brought before, which is, like, when I think about the messaging side of it, it's, like, so many, so many app or dApps come out and they're, like, we are decentralized. But to the general public, they're, like, what does that mean? Yeah. Why do I care? Right, and so like uh, I think it's Canwork is like an example. Like they're a freelancing platform, and they basically because of decentralization, instead of saying we're decentralized, what they come out and say is it is 16 times cheaper to use our service than Upwork because we have an internal token. Or like it's the messaging behind what what the benefits are to the user because just telling the user we're decentralized, everyone's like cool. Like, tell them that they that their data can get hacked less, like significantly less. Like, tell them that it's cheaper. Tell them that all of a sudden, because Canwork actually allows, because Canwork allows it for the use of cryptocurrency, all of a sudden the two billion people that are unbanked can all of a sudden become freelancers and use this service. Like, those are real real world benefits. Unlike just walking into or not walking in, but messaging that is basically like we're decentralized. Which you're like. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, decentralized is a big term. Big too. word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big, very big word, very long. Yeah, term. it has a lot of connotations. I mean, the, the main thing being the private keys, and then on the mainnet, and then I think everything. Uh, I think everything that comes on with the whole founder team stepping away, and yeah. walking off into the wilderness. I, I, I think that <laughs> you know you've got to you've got to grow a business to some to just some level before you can do that, and maybe that happens, maybe it doesn't. But I think the main thing is. That is the, the control of private keys and then being on a mainnet where there is you know, visibility on, on transactions. Well, let's switch topics for a second. Um, how about, you know, what kind of DAP do you think it'll be? Like, what's, what's the killer DAP that's, that's really going to take all this mainstream? Tickets. Tickets. <laughs> that's yeah, I mean, of course, I think that chat is like, you know, potentially the killer app, really. Um, you know, there's so many chat applications that are reading everything that we write and storing on servers and, and storing our passwords in plain text like Facebook just, we just found out over oh, 100 million, yeah, we started 100 million uh, passwords in plain text on our servers, sorry guys. And, uh, there's all of this, there's the curse of centralization, which is that, you know, it's a tar it's a place where you can target an attack, where with, with chat, with sense chat, you know, there is no central storage of messages or keys. Everyone's keys live on the blockchain. That's the public key infrastructure that we use. So the chat app references that. So it doesn't need to transfer keys between the phones to talk. And, and I think that's pretty cool. And then we also have things that we're doing with the token that are interesting. Things we're doing with channels that are interesting that are different from what you can do in other chat applications. So, you know, I think, I think one of the big things about crypto that I've been really wondering about in the past few days is like, you know, what's the big demographic of crypto in the world, and, or blockchain in general, and I think it's like making money online. Right? It seems to be a very common theme. People want to make money online. And that's a big, broad concept, but, it, but it's, it's kind of interesting to think about because that's sort of what the token system enables you to do. Like, that's the whole point very simple peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And so that's something we're also considering, is what, would, what does it look like to get paid to chat? And how can we enable people to create their own uh, you know, ecosystems? And almost like the future of web pages, we believe, is like these chat groups. You know, instead of building a web page to sell your products, you can have a chat group with some links in it, and you know, maybe there's a public web page version of that. So that's what we're moving towards now. So, so what, what I think is interesting is like instead of saying what is going to be the killer DAP that will like take everything to scale, um, what I think is an interesting way to look at it is what will be like what industry so far has proven to, to basically take things very quickly to scale. And I mean, I think if we look at like some of the major companies that are out there right now, um, you have Upwork, it took 20 years to get to where they are now, three mergers and tens of millions of dollars. Um, Airbnb took, uh, I think, four years to get over a million users. Like, we're in year one. And so the question is, is like, what industry actually, for me at least, what industry actually has the ability to scale really quickly? And I don't have too much expertise in this, but from my understanding, that potentially could be gaming. It could be one really massive, well-constructed um, game that could actually kind of take us to a more mass adoption level. And these are already, gamers are already people that understand kind of the inner workings of how the system works too. So they're, so in terms of like adoption and getting people on board and trying to teach people like how the cryptocurrency system as a whole, blockchain system as a whole works, like these are people that are already there. So. I think gaming has the ability as an industry, one big game in that industry, to really take us to a level of mass. Yeah, I think there's already a lot of games that are yeah. just... In V-Bucks, for example. Yeah, I mean, V-Bucks, you can transfer V-Bucks to another... another Gambling, right? Although yeah. oh, not in the US. Yeah, no, but I think V-Bucks is a really good example. There's actually... Uh, what is that, Fortnite? Yeah. In Fortnite, you actually buy V-Bucks, virtual dollars, and you spend them on things in the game. Yeah, you I can't get those things out of the game, you can't trade them with other people, and that's sort of the future of like, D-goods and virtual goods, where you can buy these skins and things, and then if you want to sell them to another player, you should be able to. That, 
happens in some games on like a on like a third party market, yeah. but the future of games is that embedded into the game, sort of. Yeah. You know, that's already happening with Geos Knights and other games that are doing this. It's pretty wild. What's the status of that though? Like I I've heard over the past what, half year that there are people doing that, they're working on this problem. Um, does, does anyone happen to know like what the I state mean, of that is? I think that EOS Knights is already doing it and it's very popular. And there's other games too that I'm probably just not even aware of. I feel like you had a really good statistic, if I remember correctly, like on one call probably like, I don't know, four or five months ago, that was like, that it was around EOS Dice, the amount of revenue volume they were doing on a daily basis yeah, in their prime. The, yeah, it was like the... Uh, Do you remember how much they were doing like the, in their prime? The. Uh, Average revenue per user, daily average revenue yeah. per user is dark poo. Yeah. Um, I think it was something like six dollars a user. Yeah. Which is like, I mean, most apps are like ten cents or right. less, like a fraction of a penny or something. But I think the total mass of what they were doing, like their average revenue on a daily basis, and please, no one quote me on this, was something like it was like two million or twenty million or something. I something in the millions on a daily like basis. Six months ago, yeah. I saw statistics in, and, and it was like. Every 14 days, they need like 30 million dollars. Yeah, yeah, which is crazy. Yeah, we're talking and about this is and this is gambling. Yeah, which is technically online gambling is illegal in the U.S. But you know, a lot of these countries were, a lot of these you know, gaps were outside. Well, I think I think one thing to understand is that whenever something new opens up, that allows industries that are highly regulated to for new players to end up and pass the regulation, they're going to use those platforms like the internet, obviously. When it first started, a lot of people were gambling because you didn't, you didn't have to get licenses to get on there, you know, porn and all of a sudden. It's the same thing with any new technology that allows you to bypass the regulatory infrastructure. So who is the most incentive to be there is the people that can make the most money doing things like this. But the gambling apps are very interesting. I don't know if a lot of people know how they work. And I think it's just really interesting to, to talk about for a second because the way it works is as you play the game, you're earning uh, some token that the platform has. Like, if you play on EOS bets, you earn bets tokens. And whatever games you're playing in the casino, they're constantly giving these little chips. And then those chips share in 100% of the revenue of what the casino makes. It's share, yeah. So it offsets even the odds of the games that people are playing. And that's why it became so massive. And I think it's going to still keep growing because my guess is a lot of people don't even really know that this is how it works. But the people that do know are making a killing on it. Yeah. And then for every new user that you refer, you get um, a percentage of what they get. Yeah, like, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's like yeah, the craziest pyramid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously the casinos own a large chunk of the tokens that they're getting distributing the, the value, but you know, gaming and and and, and games, I think, is is a really it's a really good point. Yeah. You were saying. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> So where do we have to go from here? The, the DAP industry. What do you? What do you? What needs to happen? Okay, let's talk about this next year. What would you like to see over this next year? So I, UX. I think UX. I don't know. I always bring it back to like. I always bring it back to like. I think Crystal's favorite example. Thanks for showing up, Crystal, today. Um, which is CryptoKitties, right? Like yeah. in four days, it went from basically like a thousand users to twenty-seven thousand users. All of a sudden, the fees on Ethereum were, I think, like 16 times the fees that they were four days prior. And so it keeps coming back to this, for me, like what I can think about is the scalability issue, right? It's like, how, how are we actually solving this? And is it, is it in a way that's actually working? Is, I mean, are there enough applications out there with that kind of transaction volume that we're, that we're scalability is, is the number one? Or is, it, is there still, I feel like there's, there's still not enough applications out there that are really going to... Applications with enough, with enough track. Yeah, well, yeah, to clog up the... Yeah, but as you're watching, the like, all these well, big banks start to come into the space, like, they all have a ton of users. And granted, they're not necessarily operating on public, on these, like, public blockchains. Like, they're creating their own more practiced blockchains. But, like, yeah, I think they have to deal with that, for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying scalability yeah. is not the thing, but I, I wonder whether the, the actual... You know, all the companies that have raised the money and, and act the ones who have been building, when they come out with their applications and they have the UX and they actually get into the market, I feel like that's probably the, the first stage you know, where people in this room can actually test it out and decide which ones they're going to use. And then 
okay, I'd love to have problems like in Turkey, so we can actually say, okay, well, maybe yes, we've got a dog there, or you know, yeah, I mean, what, those, those become sort of, uh, you know, the protocol layer. What would you say is the biggest issue for you guys? In terms of adoption? I mean, just right off the top of the question, you know? I mean, we, we've kind of solved the scalability, you know, internally we combined NFTs and fungible tokens into a sidechain and did some stuff, so we're transacting pretty fast, like 400 transactions. Uh, so, okay, so, but we needed that because we had to potentially have 100,000 people walking through a gate at the same time, and, you know, so those sorts of issues, but I think the... Wait, the, the bigger... <laughs> the, yeah, the bigger issue is, is really uh, beyond the crypto oriented events or the people who are happy to take our business, it's, it's really business development, which is actually getting more people to adopt what, we're, what we've got. And I think that's going to be the bigger challenge. So it's actually getting users? It's actually getting... Uh, we're, we're, getting users, kind of a, getting yeah, our business is kind of a B2B. Ours yeah. is a kind of B2B business primarily, where you have to go to businesses to get them to, to, to use the product, and then the, the consumers end up using it because they have to. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, when you go to these other businesses to get them to use your products, do you mention blockchain? That's a key selling proposition for us. And so... They like it. I mean, they love the fan rewards, the fan tokens and, and things like that, because it gives them additional engagement opportunities with their fans. Um, and then the, the blockchain, what's valuable for them is that when a ticket resells into a secondary market, usually it's the abyss. So you can put a ticket on Unit Seeds and StubHub, and the original operator of the event never makes any money. But with the smart contracts, you know, we can actually set that, you know, Coachella will make money no matter how many times the ticket's been oh, sold. So that margin we can set at the outset, and then they get paid. So they love that. It's funny because that's, that. that's not a cryptocurrency or blockchain issue. That is that's just a company point. issue. Like, that's just like any company in the beginning is like, what do we need more of partners? You know, what do we need more of the right. new business, right? It's yeah. like, that's, that's less, to me at least, like, that's less, like, or more money, right? Like, that's that's so standard to yeah. what it's any yeah, startup has. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a super normal issue. I feel like whenever you mention blockchain or Bitcoin or any of this stuff to, you know, a non-crypto person, their heads explode and they're like, oh, isn't that that fraudulent thing, blah, blah, Do you feel like when you mention blockchain to normal people, do you have to educate or explain or I'll, any of that stuff? I was glad in the front row. I mean, he, he's our business development head and he, I mean, half, half of the people hate it um, and they sort of... As I mentioned before, they are, oh, you know, you guys are blockchain, Bitcoin guys, and the other people are really interested. And then when we when we explain the, the monetary gains and the benefits that they can have, like the secondary resale, uh, they love it. And the fan engagement in solving one of the problems that they have. Uh, as long as you're solving a problem, you can eventually get them to, to yes. Uh, it's just, it just takes time. Very interesting. Um... We only have, well, we have, we have a little bit of time left, but I, I want to go down the road. You know, what a, maybe I'll present you a couple questions and, and you can answer whichever one you want, but what is something you did not expect when you were voting your DAP? And maybe what's one piece of advice you'd give to a potential DAP developer in the room? Uh, when I started building, I built a point of sale system called DigiCafe, and it's basically a mobile point of sale that allows anybody to accept Digibyte payments. So it was just, it's because I wanted to go to my local coffee shop and buy a cup of coffee with my coins, and there was no way to do that, and you know, unless you just transfer wallet to wallet. So I just set out as a project for myself to build this, and I, I went at it from a user's perspective. So my whole goal was like, how do I make this simple? It's got to be dead simple. And for me, building that, that was my whole mindset. And I think that's super important is you have to think about, you have to think about your grandma, you know, and your mom and dad. It's like, I have to make this stupid simple. Like, it's got to be so easy. So that was driving me through the whole process. And, it, and you know, if you download DigiCafe, it's, you can find it, you know, on, on the app stores. It's really simple. You just pop in your Digibyte address and everything passes through to an external wallet. And you don't even realize it's just like ringing up the sale. It converts all the prices for you. 
So I think that's the kind of mindset we need as developers is like, how do we make this simple? It's like simple, simple, simple. And uh, even the wallets we download, it's like we have our 12 word phrase and that's a showstopper for a lot of people because it's like, what are these 12 words? You know, it's like, I'm done, we can click. So, so even when building a wallet, I'm sort of considering other options like, um, you know, password encryption versus the 12 poker phrases. So I just, those kind of ideas I think are, are really important. And uh, just how do we make it simpler, simpler? Like a password and grab the keys to our server. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if somebody finds it, it's useless. Yeah. Let's then make a password. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, right turn. Oh, okay, my turn. Yeah, personal, personal. Uh, I think that one of the big things we we didn't really anticipate being this hard is that the Apple App Store is really difficult to work with. They have uh, an incredible amount of guidelines, and you know they they seem like they're static, but they're they're sort of not because they're open to the interpretation of the app reviewer. So. We released the app almost a month ago, and since then, every update we've had has been rejected. But not because of anything we've changed or added new, but because of other things that they have decided now that we're not doing correctly, even though they have been approving it for months before. And I don't know if we should get targeted for being a crypto app, because you know Apple makes their money by you do an in-app purchase for digital things. Now, if you have other ways to circumvent that to get some kind of digital item, that's potentially costing them money. So they're not exactly excited about, about blockchain. Are you finding the same thing with the Google Play Store? Google Play Store, no problem. Interesting. We actually diverged. Now we're just, we're, we're just keep pushing updates. We've done, I think, almost nine updates on Android, and we can't even get any through the App Store. Interesting. I mean, we got one through yesterday, actually. So, it happened now. But that's a big deal. I think, I think building out, I know we're really excited about it. Really cool. But I think overall, it's like, I like the idea of building web first, really, when you're building any type of app. Um, just depends on the app. I mean, for us, it's like, who uses chat on the web? I don't know. It's more of a mobile app thing. So, mm -hmm. we felt like we didn't really have a choice. But Interesting. We're going to build web later. So, um, I'm going to talk about it more, I think, from the capital and funding side. Um, so, just because I have a fund and then I have a fundraising company, um, or lead tech company, um, and so I think that uh, the important, the really important piece, which like, typically for me, what I, what I like look at is like, typically founders are trying to solve too many problems. Um, like, there's not just one really simplistic problem that's trying to be solved, like they're trying to solve like, three different problems in one product. And I think that it goes back to kind of what you were saying about like the simplicity behind it, which is just like, go out and start to solve one problem. Don't try to solve many problems. And then the other piece is like, actually make sure that if, when you're going through the fundraising partner process or the partnership process, you're actually utilizing all of your resources. Like your social network is so important to be utilizing and if you're not actually taking full advantage of that, then you're just doing a disservice to yourself and to your own company. That's great. All right, pressure's on. Yeah, I mean, like, for us, and I think for the other applications or DAFs that are being built, um, I would really target this audience in this room and, and people in the crypto community rather than the outside world first, uh, because they're, we get it, and we get the challenges. We, we've gone through the 20 stage processes, and I think we understand what, what we're trying to do here. Um, so if there's an opportunity to, to tap into a small section of our audience where the application meets the, um, the needs of that particular audience, then I think that's the focus um, that I would recommend. Because we had to go through it, and it took me you know, nine months of people abusing me on Twitter to, to realize <laughs> that maybe crypto people are better people, even though they are abusing me on Twitter. Um, you know, at least they're a bit more receptive. So. Awesome. Last question, and this time we're going to go this way, which is predictions for DApps. Um, it can be short term, long term, whatever you want. I mean, I think this past year, I think, uh, because the DApps had such a, I guess, a negative connotation through the you know, post ICO kind of world, um, every, you know, from an investor standpoint, most people started focusing on scale, scaling and protocols. Um, and there have been some really good developments in that over the last you know, 12 months. I think 
dabs will come back um, over the next 12 months and they'll become really important because the question of mass adoption will start to creep back into people's minds. It's like, okay, well, now we're at 6,000, now we're at 7,000. How, we, how are we going to get to, you know, Tim Draper's, you know, predictions or Kathy's predictions? We have to, we have to really um, get to use this in a way that's uh, meaningful. So I think a dash will come back in the next four months. Yeah, I think um, I think slow and steady here. Like I think there is the opportunity that there could be like one big breakout dab that just kind of like in a six to twelve month period really just like shows true mass adoption. But my guess is is that as a dab market, um, it's going to be more of a slow and steady build. It's going to take five years. It's going to take ten years, twenty years. Um, and it's going to have multiple iterations, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that all of a sudden it's like tomorrow mass adoption is going to be solved, or in the next six months mass adoption is going to be solved, because it's not just a DAP issue; it's every startup issue. How do we gain mass adoption? And we just have more barriers to entry. The more we talk about the, not the more we use it, but the more we talk about the cryptocurrency and blockchain and decentralization side, because that stuff shouldn't really be too much user facing. Like it should benefit the user, but in a language that actually makes sense to have a conversation about that people understand. I'm gonna make a couple of predictions. Okay. First of all, one first one's actually a hope. I hope someone comes up with an alternative app store. You know, I really I would agree. love to see an alternative app store. It doesn't stay like app, app store. Another thing is um, I definitely think that when it comes to mass adoption, if you're looking at straight numbers, that countries like India and China have the most people. So, and Africa too, you know, these countries are, are underserved by technolo technological innovation and that people who target those with their apps are gonna get way more users than you're gonna get in the US and Europe. So, and the other, the third prediction is just mergers and acquisitions, I think will become more common. I think um, maybe within a couple of years, we'll start seeing, I'd really like the use case I wanna see is like leveraging for the, sh the sharing economy. And I, I think, I don't know, it's gonna be the right fit. It's gotta be the right fit for the right market because blockchain isn't really necessarily gonna solve problems for everybody. It doesn't even make sense in some businesses, but if you have a situation where you need to audit transactions maybe with large groups of people, maybe it's sort of pooling money and then dispersing payments. Um, I think that'd be a good solution if somebody you know, could come up with something there. I think that's probably possible in a couple of years. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Everyone give them a big round of applause.